And we're hey, live Chair, on it's Tony Goodwin. We are live on Facebook. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our um, Lower Western River MAC uh, meeting this October 20th. Um, hope everyone's got fall like happiness. Um, <laughs> And it's been the weather's been good, so that's that that's a good thing in in a not too hot kind of way. Um, but let's uh, call the uh, meeting to order. Um, clerk is uh, Debbie, and I see her up in the corner. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time if I go like this or squint. It's because I forgot my glasses at the office. <laughs> Sorry. So, so Chair Pip, you're ready for me to yeah. call this to order at 531? Yeah. That's correct. And then if uh, Vesta, mm -hmm. you can lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. That would be awesome. OK, as soon as that flag comes up, I will. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the of United, United States, States of America. Of America. And to the, and to the republic for which it stands, stands. One, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you, Vesta. Uh, <laughs> Debbie, can you call roll? Sorry about that. Um, let me see, do I have my, I'll just go from the, from the uh, screen. So we have um, Vesta Cope Stakes. Present. Alice Teeter. Present. Nick Pereira. Present. Lisa Naminson. Present. Pip Marquez de la Plata. Here. Naomi Huffstetter. Present. And is that everybody on the, I don't have the list. That's, those are all of the representatives, right? Uh, Tony Goodwin, Casadero oh, is present. And I didn't see you because there is no picture. Tony Goodwin. I'm having trouble with my video. No I'm problem. As we Sorry. speak. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> all right. Uh, thanks, Debbie. Um, Let's uh, move to approving the agenda. Everyone should have the agenda. Um, does someone on the council want to move to approve the agenda for this evening? I approve I move. first, second, whatever. <laughs> Best of uh, so anyone second? Second. I second that. <laughs> All right, we got Alice as a second. <clears throat> okay, um, now's the time. If anyone um, on the council has a conflict of interest with any item on the agenda, um, we should bring it up now. Anyone, anyone? That's it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> consent calendar, everyone has had the minutes to look over and peruse. I know we had one change that we need to um, make with a name of an organization. And I don't know, Debbie, if you've already made that. No, we did not. Oh, okay. Anyone else have any comments or want to move to approve the minutes? Uh, Pip, I have one question. Uh, yes, Cynthia. Uh, it's toward the end of the minutes, and it makes it says that uh, uh, with the restructuring stuff, they're wanting to improve efficiency because there are over 40 community service districts in the area. And I'm wondering if we meant to say over more than 40 special districts. It sort uh, of actually matters. If that's at the very end? Yeah, toward, toward the very end of the minutes. And is that the, in the staff report section? Um, no, it was, uh, it was the part on the, um, the, the potential restructuring, the, uh, Okay. 
I, I don't even see it. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't. I don't okay. have my glasses, so <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm, strug I'm struggling right. to find where you're looking. It's okay. Well, just the community service districts are usually groupings of special districts. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, given that, do, does anyone uh, move to approve the minutes? I move. Okay. And then I saw Vesta second. I'll second. Yes, thank you. Great. With, with those two corrections, I think we're good to go. Cynthia, I'm so impressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, now, now um, for, for folks on the, the, the council, this is the time, if there was something not on the agenda, you need to make an announcement about, um, now's the time to do it. Um, and if, I'm just going to ask this in, in the next section for people to keep brief because we have a lot of a lot of items on the agenda. So, uh, Nick. I just want to keep pushing the uh, Guerneville Vets Hall Sheriff substation topic to the top of the agenda um, and start that conversation going. Um, see if we can get a briefing on where we are and what needs to happen by, by all of the associated parties and then see where we need to go forward and what we need to act on. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, Vesta? Um, I just want to thank the Forestville Chamber of Commerce for a successful summer of ch um, farmers markets and for the Forestville Planning Association for a successful trash day. I was not here, but I hear it was really well done. So thank you very much for our community, for people stepping up and being part of this. Thank you. Thanks, Vesta. Um, uh, Naomi? I would just like to remind the community that this is our last meeting before election day and um, do something with your day, such as voting. All right. Um, anybody else? I don't see any hands. <laughs> Get a little closer to the screen. Um, okay. Uh, thank you all. Uh, now, uh, public comment. So this, this is for public to comment or make a statement on items that are not on the agenda. If they're on the agenda, um, you can hold your comments until we get to that section. And we're gonna hold this section here to a total of 10 minutes because we have a lot on our agenda tonight. So uh, Jason, do you see anyone that's got their hand up? Go ahead, Rhonda. Okay, great. Good evening. Um, can you see me? Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. So, 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 Carol, you just gave the thumbs up. Can you see me? I guess it's not necessary. Yeah, we can, we can hear you, Rhonda. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay. Um, so, so I am a resident of Forestville, and thank you for allowing me to just um, to share this with you. And I spoke with Debbie the other day because uh, I am I'm I'm kind of at my wit's end <laughs> about this large motor home that seems to be for the last couple of weeks residing in. We've got both a park on Front Street in Forestville and the youth park. And so it's moving around. It's there even as we sp I speak uh, from one park to the other, from one side to the other in the park on Front Street. And so I, I have made a call to the sheriff's office a couple of times because it, I just it's it's kind of creepy. It's this large vehicle that just keeps moving around town. And I just feel like what can we do with this? Because one person doing that is one thing. If you get four or five, it gets more difficult. So, so uh, I was, it was suggested to me by the sheriff who was wonderful that uh, nothing can really be done about it, I guess, if, if they're not committing any crime and if they're not sleeping there at night. So for two consecutive nights, I, a single woman in the dark, drove down to see if they were sleeping in either of the parks. They weren't. But the, the upshot is that 
I run around here a lot. And over time, I've seen cars pulled over to the side, people living out of them. I've seen RVs pulled over in Martinelli Road and Sunridge Road and Trenton Road. And Rhonda, Rhonda, you've yeah. reached your, your two minutes. Um, I, oh, think, I, I think about I heard about this as well. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone for fifth districts want to comment on this, but one thing that I'll, I'll say is on things like this, make sure, definitely reach out to fifth district if you think necessary, but your Mac reps are also really good conduits to get answers from folks at the fifth district. So make sure they're aware of these issues as well. Our next person is Peter. All right, um, Peter. I guess I'll hurry up. So when the two minute clock starts, I'll be finished when it ends. So my name is Peter Voorhees. I'm a homeowner in Monterio on right along Moscow Road. Um, I am interested in the Lower Russian River Mac because of my issues with my septic system that I'm trying to put in. Um, it's incredibly frustrating. I don't want to bore you with all the details right now, but I just wanted to introduce myself and say hello. And, and there you go. That's it. Thanks, Peter. Any more hands up? No more hands up, Chair. Okay, thanks. And I'm having a hard time hearing you, Jason. Now I've got a vision and a hearing problem. Oh, no. <laughs> um, Okay, um, we're going to move to our regular calendar items. And the first up is Supervisor Hopkins. So if you would kindly take the floor. Thank you so much. I will try to make this as quick as I poss possibly can. Um, try to cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time. A few updates on things that are happening at the Board of Supervisors. Um, the BIA, which is a TOT assessment for Sonoma County Tourism, was actually on the consent calendar on Tuesday to go before the Board of Supervisors to change um, kind of how they collect money from local hotels. The, um, Sonoma County Tourism is proposing to eliminate the current threshold wherein they only charge the BIA business improvement assessment or area, I can't remember, um, one of those things that um, it, for businesses that earn above $350,000 a year, they are proposing to remove that to generate an additional two to two and a half million dollars a year. Um, and of the, I think, roughly 4,000 businesses or um, in, you know, property owners that will be impacted by this, 2,200 are located in unincorporated Sonoma County. And I am guessing, although I did not get the data, that there will be a large concentration along the Lower Russian River and the coast. There had been no community outreach conducted before this appeared on the consent calendar on Tuesday. So I pulled it from the consent calendar and specifically asked um, staff as well as Sonoma County Tourism to reach out and engage with our lower Russian River and coastal communities. Since obviously we've been talking a lot about vacation rentals, we've heard from everyone on this issue, then to have something kind of sneak by on consent didn't feel right. So that will come back to the board in early November. And then again, I believe in December. Um, so definitely if you have some feelings about that, um, you know, let us know and we can definitely make sure that there is an engagement process for unincorporated Sonoma County. Um, another update, homelessness, wanted to mention that we were finally able to get CHP to clear the encampment on 116 within the Caltrans right of way. Unfortunately, as I've been, I've been informed by neighbors, many of those vehicles have now relocated to the park and ride. We were already offering services and you know, trying to get folks out of that area. Um, the additional pressure, and I actually just received an email within a couple of hours um, talking about observing sort of an open um, barrel that contains human waste in it and the location um, that we really need to um, address this. So I've been playing phone tag uh, with Johannes and I'm still trying to connect with county staff so that we can actually get a timeline for when and how this is going to be um, ultimately enforced and cleared because it does pose um, sort of a health and safety hazard at this point. Um, additionally, had a wonderful meeting, just so everyone knows, with um, Sheriff-elect Eddie Engram um, over coffee last week and we discussed the idea of actually doing sort of a, you know, a little bit of a West County tour early next year, potentially with um, the DA elect, although I haven't gotten to um, speak to Carla Rodriguez about it yet, um, but, you know, just meet and greet sort of local leaders here, see how we can partner between all of our different offices with all of our different resources to address the concerns, particularly the concerns in the Lower Russian River. So stay tuned. That is something that we're going to try to plan for the first quarter of next year. 
Um, also wanted to mention update Board of Supervisors approved the Lower Russian River Governance Study to be launched and um, Blue Sky is the consultant that we have hired for this task. We will bring this before the MAC at the next meeting. Your engagement is going to be critical on this. And I also want to make sure that this doesn't sort of snowball too quickly with lots of rumors, right? You know, folks, I think are like, oh my gosh, does this mean there's going to be a new tax? No, this is really about what services do we need in the Lower Russian River? What services are currently provided? And what is sort of the sustainable model to ensure that those needs are met into the future? And community engagement is going to be absolutely critical as we move forward with this. Um, a few quick meeting updates um, for sort of your calendar looking forward. There is a housing element meeting with Permit Sonoma that is tentatively targeted for Tuesday, November 15th at 530. We're still waiting for confirmation on that one. That is going to sort of shape the work that goes into the general plan in terms of housing affordability and accessibility in unincorporated Sonoma County. Um, I believe it is next week. We have our Healthy Forest Ad Hoc, which is comprised of myself and Supervisor James Gore, looking at sort of vegetation management as well as ecosystem health. And that community outreach meeting is happening um, October 26 at 6 p.m. And so if you email us, we can send you the Zoom links for all of these things. We also in the past couple of weeks had both a telecom town hall as well as a mental health town hall. And we are looking at planning um, sort of a series of local specific town halls for next year, just recognizing that, hey, now we can get together in person again. And, you know, we can start doing these hybrid meetings. And so, you know, please reach out if you would like to help us host one in your community for next year. We're going to try to plan out sort of in advance so that we get lots of time to let folks know about it. Also wanted to mention that we do have a CAG meeting next week, Thursday, 6 p.m. on the 27th. So, and if, if you have any questions, I'm not going to cover it because it was in the newspaper and it's kind of, you know, there's about the living wage ordinance or the well moratorium. I'm happy to answer any questions on that as well. Thank you. Um, uh, council members, any, any questions for Supervisor Hopkins? Uh, Naomi? Hi, Linda, thank you. Um, as far as the BIA and the TOT tax change, has anything been mentioned yet as far as what, um, what income would be taxed or is that still vague or is it any income? So it's a, um, a TOT percent that's tacked on that is currently tacked on to those businesses that are earning, I, you know. I over. understand. Yeah. I'm sorry. I think it's, my question, I my question do. yeah, no, I'm sorry. I do know that. What I meant to say is I do know it's over 350,000 per business or individual. Is there anything like, is there any news? What would be the income for an individual? Like what's it gonna be like? If an individual made thirty thousand dollars, would they be taxed? Is there anything going on as far as the threshold with a change of it currently being three hundred and fifty or above, which would it, affect many individuals? That's my question. It would be across the board, um, so it would be anything above zero. Essentially, if you earn income um, from a vacation rental or a small hotel or you know motel, um, you would have to apply this two percent um, BIA. Okay, thank you. And, and also just worth mentioning um, one thing that came up, which is an interesting situation, is there will be a protest period wherein um, sort of greater than 50% of sort of the amount of revenue that is generated, if it hits that threshold, um, then this tax would not go forward. However, it's going to go to everybody, including those who are already in the, the business improvement area. So essentially, even if every single new person who's impacted by this tax protested, there's no way that they could actually overturn it. So it's pretty much an automatic, assuming that everyone else says, hey, yeah, we're just going to keep paying exactly what we're already paying. Um, the new folks who are going to be taxed can't actually stop it. So it's just, just, just an FYI. Um, where does the BIA TOT portion go? What's it goes it straight for? to Sonoma County Tourism to be used for marketing purposes. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. <coughs> Anyone else on the council? Questions? Nope. Okay, let's go to um, public public comment. Eric? Yeah, thank you very much. This is Eric Frazier with Truth and Tourism. I did want to take a moment on that BIA uh, tax, and it is a tax, not an assessment, just to make <laughs> comments because it is cloaked in a little bit of mystery, and I'm afraid the supervisor didn't bring a lot of illumination to it. The $350,000 
uh, threshold that's set right now was set when it was originally passed, and there was a reason for it, but the county has been silent on why that reason existed. We think it has to do with the small nature of the operations that would be subject to the tax under 350,000 <clears> because they are actually quite different in composition. Uh, <clears throat> and she's quite right though, that there's no way that the small operators could even stop this or even comprehend it, nor do they benefit by representation on these uh, tourism boards, whether it's SCT or the one in Santa Rosa. <clears throat> So this tax is really unfair and there's no way to really protest it, but at least there's an opportunity to understand it. And I'm sorry it's so obfuscated at the moment, but <clears throat> it is worth truly understanding because it is uh, a doorway into government patronage. It's a tax that may be, it is a tax, not an assessment. It's a tax that's coming upon the shoulders of evacuees and people that are using uh, overnight accommodations. They're subjected to this tax as well, essential workers, uh, people that are just occasional happy, hobbyists in the uh, short-term rental space, all subjected to this tax. Many jurisdictions as well. Another thing to keep in mind is the number of people that are contacted is way different than what the supervisor tells us as the number of operators out there as vacation rentals or short-term rentals. So yeah, there's a lot of things to take a look at with this BIA. It's a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other folks have their hands raised? I see my, um, Mr. Nichols. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I would like to thank Supervisor Hopkins on convening the uh, telecom town hall. Uh, it was unfortunate that Frontier Communications and Verizon uh, uh, didn't attend the meeting. Most of our complaints have been that have been recently submitted to Nextdoor and to the supervisor's office and to CPC have involved these two companies. Is there any way that we can get them to the table? Okay, um, Liza. Hello, this is Liza Graves. I just want to uh, correct a misperception here on the BIA. That is not a tax on the owner of a property. That is a tax on the guest who stays at a property, just like TOT is. <clears throat> so when uh, TOT is across the county 12% and it's paid by the guest on short-term rentals, that's rentals of less than 30 nights. And the same is true with BIA. So the owner's income is not being taxed. The owner is responsible or Airbnb uh, for collecting the tax and remitting it to Sonoma County. And the funds get used to uh, support um, the vacation rental community. Um, as well as um, others in the hospitality industry. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands. Uh, Jason, I'm missing anything from Facebook. We are good to go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hopkins, as always. Um, one yep. other update, if that's okay. Yep. Um, I do want to mention, and I appreciate um, Peter's comment about his septic challenges. Um, and, you know, we are actually also going through a performance management review process for PRMD. So I wanted to mention that, and that is something that will come before the Board of Supervisors in early January, because we recognize that there, you know, have been challenges with permitting processes. Um, and so we're soliciting feedback from the community and we'll come up with sort of a plan to um, try to help address these challenges in the future. So I want to mention that as well. Great, thank you. Okay, I like um, having a section that starts with the word happy. <laughs> so we're gonna um, move on to the happy arts presentation and Kristen Madsen is here from Creative Sonoma and we're all gonna feel happy after this, right? <laughs> you know, I wanna just 
say I didn't put happy in my title, <laughs> but I will try to live up to that. And yes, I hope we will all be happy when we finish this section. So great. Thank, thank you. you. For, thank you for coming. You got it. Thank you so much for letting me join your meeting. And I'm going to take a quick second and share my screen, if that's all right. There we yeah. go. All right. So I know there are uh, many familiar faces that I see on the screen, but many um, unfamiliar new faces for me. So I'm going to give you a real thumbnail on Creative Sonoma. Um, we were established about seven years ago as the county's agency designed to help support and advance the creative and cultural community in Sonoma County. And we do it predominantly through uh, things like grant making and professional development and training for artists and arts organization staff. Um, we have a very robust arts education program to try to ensure that we have that that our TK through 12 students have access to quality arts education, and then through a variety of special initiatives. You'll recognize some of our uh, recent grants they've gone to, for example, um, the River Arts Collective and Artists. Uh, we'll have a picture of that later for the painted storefront windows on Main Street in Guerneville, and we have funded um, the some, the Casadero Music Camp for scholarships specific for Sonoma students to be there. Um, and then we have funded many other projects um, of individual artists in your area. And I'm happy to talk about Creative Sub Sonoma <laughs> ad nauseum offline for anyone who would like to talk to me more about it. But I mentioned there for a minute that we do special initiatives. And one of them is the reason that I'm here today. And that is we are engaged in the process of developing a public art plan and program for Sonoma County. Now, public art means many things to many people and they can be all different. So for the purposes of our conversation, we're talking about public art as meaning bringing art into our public realm for the public good. Now, usually, but not always, a public art program might be tied to new construction and a building. And usually, but not always, it is thought of as a physical manifestation, a physical artwork, a sculpture or a mural, but that's also not always the case. Um, maybe your most recent example of public art that I'm aware of in your area, uh, not funded publicly, but um, in a public place is this beautiful mural on this slide from Amanda Lynn. So we're, as I say, going through this process to develop a plan because many of the municipalities in Sonoma County already have their own municipal public art plan, but the County of Sonoma doesn't have one. And that means that the work that happens in this realm and in, in putting, public, putting art into our public sphere has to happen kind of sporadically at best, particularly in the unincorporated incorporated areas. And as best as we can do it at Creative Sonoma with whatever um, resources we can cobble together. So we've been working on this plan to figure out what could we do to make it a little bit more consistent and uh, a little more thoughtful and strategic also. So I'm here today because the outlines of this program are coming together. We've done 60 interviews. Um, we have reviewed pretty much all of the plans that exist, master plans that exist for all the various departments in the county. We have reviewed budgets in the county. And now we're starting to test drive our concepts with folks like you who don't think about art all day long like I do. Um, we'll come up with this plan, take your feedback, we'll present ultimately all of this up to the full board of supervisors and they will tell us what they think about it and how they want to move forward. So today, I would love for you to hear what I'm saying and then give me your ideas about what we say. What do you like? What makes you nervous? Um, how can you help advise us to make this make sense for your area and help us make a better proposal for going forward? All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we uh, came up with what we came up with, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we did come up with, and then talk at the end a little bit about the financing and the governance of the project. So I'm going to start by saying that when we got going, we wanted to say, how do we make a plan that really makes sense for our county? There are public art plans everywhere. Why is this one unique to Sonoma? So we asked our folks in the interviews, what do they value most about Sonoma County? And you will not be surprised that land became one of the very first items on the list. There are five others. People wanted to talk about our history, the peoples and the stories and the traditions that have shaped our county. Our innovations of making and creation. The struggles and accomplishments and traditions of all of the people in our county. 
our collective experiences. And that includes, of course, the traumas, but also our commitment to a new future together. And finally, our hunger for connection. And we know we hear this most often from uh, those of you that are living in parts that are off the central corridor of the county, and we do definitely hear that loud and clear. Now, I want to also say one thing. We're not naive going into this process. We know that there are challenges that Sonoma is facing that are going to impact our financing and our implementation for something like this and much, much more. I'll just share with you at the beginning of this that those realities have pushed us in the direction of trying to be really innovative and maybe flexible as possible in whatever kind of a plan and program we create so that we can navigate those hurdles, those we know today and those we imagine might be coming in our future. Now, one more piece that has been really helpful in shaping what we've done here harkens back to uh, the only conversation I've really been able to have one-on-one -on -one so far with Supervisor Hopkins. And that was all the way back, I'm realizing, to January of this year. And Supervisor Hopkins gave us a really important insight, which is that although we all love art for art's sake, and we will continue to find ways to fund art for art's sake, art can also be a tool to enhance other agendas, other uh, problem solving, other issues, um, and using it in things that are also functional for us and solving other problems is a great way for us to recognize that art has that power and it becomes more of a arm in arm partner with some of the other work to solve these issues that we have going on. So you'll see a lot of that as we pepper through this. All right, so our first question, we started thinking about how to do this. Our first question was, who are we gonna do this with? Wait a minute, I went past one. Oh, no, I didn't, there we go. So sorry. All right, who can we do this with? Because we can't do this by ourselves. So immediately we thought about who are the other departments in the county? We know their charges to think about the public good and make this a better place. So let's first talk to them and what have they got on their agendas that we might be able to work with them on. But then we also know there are other countywide agencies in this work. That would be places like the Smart Train or Tourism, which has been mentioned, or libraries and other kinds of kind of countywide agencies. Certainly there are nonprofits that are engaged in this kind of work. I didn't put on this list, but I will add to that our municipalities that also exist that might be wanting to talk about this. All of these partners and all of this work will then ultimately redound down to the artists and culture workers who are the backbone of our arts and culture ecosystem here. So we went about having these in-depth conversations or interviews with representatives from all of these groups to start to envision what's really going to be possible for us and where can the inclusion of art help advance those ex existing objectives and projects. What would that look like? So now I'm going to just run through quickly a couple of examples to help you envision what we're talking about here and describe some of the kinds of ways we would work together with these groups. All right, so first up is a traditional public art program usually, as I said, is attached to a building and a construction project. And usually it's something like, well, we will take what the full development cost is of this project, and we will add 1% of that budget to the project to incorporate art on the project. So for example, uh, when the county engages in building its government center, whatever the total budget would be for that project, we would hope that 1% of the budget for that would be assigned to add art in and around that facility. That's a really common program. There are other buildings coming down the pike um, in Sonoma County. There's the um, public art health lab that might be happening. There's potentially what happens at the Sonoma Development Center. There are a couple of challenges around tying solely to capital projects. The county doesn't do a lot of building. And what it does, much of that is still, again, in the kind of common core corridor and not in some of our unincorporated areas. So we wanted to think flexibly about how do we get this program into other places? So then we started thinking about other infrastructure projects like bridges. So these are not big budget projects, but maybe those could have art incorporated there. We have a lot of bridges. There are, we think roughly 15 in the pipeline for construction and renovation and budgets could be set aside for that to incorporate art into those bridges. We are actually doing a project along these lines that I want to show you. So watch for this on the Hacienda Bridge. I think those of you who know the bridge will be familiar that there's a section of the bridge. I think it's actually under the bridge um, where there is a, a metal gating that people have been able to get around behind and have been able to graffiti. And it's a dangerous um, liability. And it's also graffiti um, uh, um, 
location. So we're working with Johannes and he has set aside money and we have helped suss out an artist who is going to, who is a metalworking artist. And so he's going to make a beautiful gate because they're going to, they have to put up a, fence, a, a metal barrier anyway. So he'll make a beautiful one. And this artist has also added the process of saying, I want to think about what the Russian river represents. I want to think about the history that it represents and everything that it has seen in flowing by. And in his mind, he imagined what if all of the, that history was down at the bottom of the river? And what if you had a magnet to pull all the items up that could reflect what that means? And so this is a little image of what will become a porcelain inset into the steel bridge. This is a Native American basket. So again, an artist's mind imagining what could this mean and how can it reflect us um, and our community? This is a project we're sort of crazy about in terms of what if we work with regional parks? We have a lot of regional parks in our community. And there's a really interesting conversation that occurs when you think about our human-made elements and our nature-made elements and where those intersect. So um, imagining what we heard called the other day a wooden woolly mammoth at one of our parks might be a really interesting way to bring art and the environment together. This is on the agenda specifically for you all because I know your next agenda item is about trash. And I know that these are not big public barrels, but I did want to say there might be a way to try to help uh, change human behavior by making putting trash where it belongs a little bit more fun. This is a place where I think we will really strive to be innovative. And again, this goes back to trying to figure out how do we help our county advance its own agenda uh, objectives and how do we do this across the county. Um, this is actually a project that occurred uh, this last year with artists working with the Department of Health um, in partnership with the Office of Equity on trying to help get vaccination campaigns and information out to some of our community that might not be hearing it in uh, the language they wanted to hear it in or from messengers that they trusted. The idea behind doing this in a public art campaign would be to say, we could have an artist to be in residence, which I'll put in quotes, spend a week or several weeks with one of our county divisions and say, what do you need to advance? What objective do you need to solve? And how can art help that? And maybe it is a community engagement project whose ultimate physical manifestation is, in this case, it was a, a film that was made, it was postcards, it was posters and banners. It might be a quilt making project that there's a quilt that tries to help people know that how they have participated and how they've connected as a community to advance some sort of an objective. You can tell I'm a missionary. I'm gonna pick up speed on this. Obviously, we've got bus stops and shelters, uh, new ones coming in. They all have plexiglass backs. Um, that's a terrific canvas for art. Maybe the Guerneville Library needs some new bike racks. And so maybe we could hire an artist to help us make those bike racks, encourage people to ride their bike to the library. The final place that we would try to work would be in projects where Creative Sonoma is really kind of trying to curate a project because of a need or vacancy that we're seeing not happen, a location that is not getting much art, et cetera. This is literally uh, part of a project that we funded um, in creative reopening to try to help businesses reopen um, safely during the pandemic and use art to do that. You had a big project uh, along those lines in Guerneville. And then this is the aforementioned uh, river uh, arts project where we have just funded a second round of window treatments um, in your community. So that would be, those are some of the examples of what we think we might do if we had this kind of a public art project program. All right, so I promise to talk about funding. Of course, we need all the things that are on this slide for funding for a program like this, but a couple of other things that I just wanna mention. As I said before, there are headwinds. We're all feeling it. We know the economy is uh, a little bit scary right now. And our county is also dealing with the ongoing series of emergencies. And not only are we trying to fund what's happened with our crises, we also need to replenish our coffers um, that we have been spending all this on. We also know Sonoma County is a major county size-wise. It's big. Serving the whole county is a challenge. As I mentioned, we don't do a lot of building in the county. So we recognize that the funding streams for a project like this really won't be effective if it is solely tied to new public construction. So we're going to present to the supervisor essentially a little cafeteria menu of here are some mix and match opportunities where we might blend funding as it makes most sense coming from uh, the county's budget. So one would be for sure, yes, we do want 
an assessment, uh, not an assessment, but a 1% for our program on major projects. So maybe projects over a million dollars um, with carve outs for things like um, affordable housing. We don't want to get in the way of that at any level, put any friction there. But, you know, we would figure out what makes most sense in terms of what the public um, is funding for that. But in addition to that, we want to talk about a, uh, an, an allocation from the general fund on an agreed upon calculation on an annual basis. And maybe that is done along the lines of something like 1% of a five-year rolling average of what has actually been expended in capital expenditures. That way, all the little projects and the big projects could get rolled into one dollar figure and we could just say, here's an easy formula and maybe 1% of that goes toward public art, some associated with those building projects, but more all around the county. And we're also looking at, um, and are open to comment on this, um, the potential that most municipalities have, which is a private development fee. So when private development is done in our unincorporated areas, the folks that are working on that would also participate in this kind of a program with a percentage assessed to their construction projects. Those are That's a really uh, thin thumbnail, um, lots more details in all of that to present to the supervisors, but to just give you a sense that we're looking at a a variety of sources to help fund this going forward um, and that we'll present. And then the last piece to talk about is the governance piece. How do decisions get made? How does this work? And so what I really want to say here is public art is in the public for the public, and it has to be created with the public. So we will work hard on this to make sure that a couple of key things happen that our process is designed in such a way that there are plenty of opportunities for some significant community engagement. And that's all the way from how we talk about it, how we advertise it, individual projects, what an artist might do when he or she is selected to do this work, all the way start to finish. Second, transparency is critical. Everybody needs to know how this is working. You need to know it at the beginning of the project and again, through the middle of the project and after it's over, did we meet the standards we said we would? Did we follow the guidelines we said we would? And then the last thing I'll throw in just, and this is by a kind of hard knocks learning on my part, um, we're all gonna have to be really humble about this work and the results because art is fantastic and wonderful and people love it or they hate it. And oftentimes they hate it for a little while and then they love it. So we're gonna to need to be humble and be willing to listen and to learn and to adapt as we go through this process because even though this has happened in many other communities, it's new for us and we wanna get it right. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, kick it back to you all and let you know if there's time to talk and add feedback, I'd love that. And if not, um, I'm like I say, I'm happy to talk to folks uh, after the fact and we'll connect with you all. Oh, my, am I sorry? I was expecting the chair to call on people. Should I be calling on people? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was on mute. Um, I'm here, and so are my dogs. So, uh, we're going to go to council first. Um, any uh, questions or comments for Krista? Lisa. Hi, thanks, Pip. Um, thank you so much, Kristen. I love art in everything. And thanks for the trash can um, shout out. I wanted to say two comments, which is, it'd be wonderful if the art, um, when we say our land, if we could acknowledge, um, if we could start with some native uh, land acknowledgements Excellent. at the art pieces, so we know um, what land we're on. I think that could be incorporated and also, I'm learning this too, but to note that artists as humans and try to work on the non-binary, I know we're all of a certain age, but um, I think rolling it out non-binary would be also a good um, way to roll. So thank I, you. Thank you. I heard myself say he, she, and I thought, mm, maybe I shouldn't. So thank you very much. Uh, Alice. Hi, thank you, Kristen. Um, I want to bring up three quick things. Uh, one, as the Hacienda rep, and I can see the Hacienda Bridge from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, the top of the Hacienda Bridge, I've heard, has not been painted in 40 years. There is graffiti on it. Um, and some of it is like the cute meme stuff, like during pandemic, I put on a bra today. I, we don't want to see that as a community. And we would like to see the entire bridge be repainted. The community has uh, talked about that and said that all the other bridges have been repainted and ours has not. Um, 
I love what you guys are doing underneath it. And I love that TPW has partnered with Art. Um, I walk my dog down there every single day. So it is wonderful to see. Um, and then just a really quick cautionary tale. And I don't think that this had to do with your organization, but about two years ago during pandemic, the uh, those water drop, be kind, be safe signs went up, up and down the river on bridges over waterways. Several of them still exist. They were printed on plastic sheeting. Um, and we need to get those down before they become part of the river. Um, so I really want to put an emphasis that when we do art that's for our community, as a member of the trash ad hoc, as you know, somebody who works with river keepers to help clean things up, please, please, please let this really focus on using uh, sustainable ingredients. Um, we don't want any more plastic on or near the river. Those are excellent comments. Thank you. Uh, Vesta. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank you, Kristen. Uh, I met you when you first came on, and you're still here all these years later, and very, very dedicated. Very, How very old do you think I am, Vesta? That's making me sound like... <laughs> yeah, but I interviewed you for the Gazette. How old am I? Right. <laughs> so um, thank you. And uh, it occurred to me that with the concept of art, it's such a broad spectrum. Is it possible with these buildings, whether they are private or public, that there be a wall that is completely white that can be used for film and uh, music videos, things like that, so that all of the variations on the theme can be presented. And I know that keeping a wall white is a real challenge because somebody's gonna wanna put a mural on it of some sort, but I'd love to see a white wall, a plain white wall that is very flat that would operate as an outdoor screen. So there's a suggestion. Thank you for all you do for all artists. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Vesta. Um, I have a, uh, I think uh, two, two things. One, has there been thought put in into going into areas that are severely disadvantaged. Um, and and the, the reason I say that is lots of times if you go into those areas and it feels so oppressive and depressing that that there's got to be something that happens that I, you know, just a little bit of something nice to, to look at or to feel like they're part of or whatever may make people subconsciously or whatever not feel so bad about their circumstance. I could talk about that all night long. Right. I'll say two <laughs> quick things. Um, one, this is part of why I think we're really striving to have flexibility in this program if it is to go forward and it does get um, passed because I think that does give us the ability to say, you know, there is a special need in an area and that matters um, to everybody. And so let's try to focus funding in some wonderful art there um, through this program, because I agree with you 100%, the idea of art for everybody, not just those who can afford it is critical. And it's really critical to the equity goals that I know the county supports and that we all support. So um, through this program, I, I hope so. I hope we'll have the flexibility to do that. I will also mention that that can be accomplished and we are trying as hard as we can with what budget we do currently have on our regular grant program and through our arts education to make sure that priority areas are um, attended to as best as we can. So uh, hear that loud and clear and wide open to any support, help, ideas, suggestions in that regard. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and this is a, a project that I've actually talked to Supervisor Hopkins about and I think Elise, like we have this really ugly um, fence that's that's owned by um, Sonoma County Water Agency, and Rio Nido traditionally had had been a place that's associated with not such a great place to be. We've done so much stuff over the last ten years to kind of make people feel good about living here, and we clean things up, and then we have this we call it the the prison fence out front, um, and it's right on River Road too, so it's an entrance okay. for folks to come. So it's like a county owned thing. The residents want to do something with it. Um, is there like, and like, I'm even thinking there's this, the, the respect the river initiative going on, right? Yep. Is there like, are you looking at like partnerships between like a community and a couple of different government agencies that might already be thinking about doing something? And then how does the community bring you those things? 
Uh, absolutely. To, yes to both. And the water agency is on our list. I had a slide from them, but I took it out because in the interest of time. So we are working specifically with water agency. They're giving us some ideas of the kinds of projects that they can see happening. But now that I know one to flag with them, I'm happy to do that. And uh, yeah, we we I discussed this as sort of uh, discreetly county agencies and nonprofits as separate, but any place that we can merge that and, you know, kind of break down those silos because there are interests that are shared by multiple right. partners, we will absolutely try to do that. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Linda, is your hand raised? Yeah, I actually had a question for Kristen. I know we touched base on this in the past, but, you know, we are just having this conversation about updating the BIA ordinance, which would result in an additional two and a half million dollars for Sonoma County tourism. Is an amendment to the BIA that would actually support, in addition to marketing, also community beautification, which could, again, encourage and have benefits to local businesses. Has that been considered at all? Because, you know, of course, there's so much concern with affordability of housing and the cost of housing development that you make that more expensive. It's already so expensive to live here. So have other things like TOT, like BIA, um, been investigated? That's a really interesting question. No to BIA in the sense that we hadn't thought of that specifically. And I don't know. I mean, I know they're doing this. So I'm. we just hadn't thought about that. We did bring up with our ad hoc, we're working with uh, supervisors um, Rabbit and Gorin on this. We did bring up the idea of TOT and if there was room to look at that. And we just sort of feel like that's a little bit of a third rail that in the sense that everybody is looking at TOT and wanting to have a piece of that. But um, thank you for raising it and I we ought to explore it. So yes, and if you, if there's if I should talk to you or someone on your team a little bit about it in terms of how to gently go about that conversation, I'd be happy to do that. Well, I think, are you on the board still at Sonoma County Tourism? I am. So I, I would say just oh, reach out yeah, to Claudia and to Ethan Brown because um, they're in the process of modifying and bringing in an additional $2 million of revenue. So if there's yeah. an opportunity to modify the existing ordinance, um, I believe that is an allowable use. I was just kind of looking up the state code. So God, I'm sorry. I was thinking of going at it a different way, but yes, that makes sense. Yes, happy to do that. All right. Um, anyone else on the council? No hands up, no hands up. Okay, I'm gonna go to the public. Um, and uh, Brian, you have your hand up. You have a question for Kristen. Brian, do you have a question about the, the art, art um, conversation we've just been having? Hi, right, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah. No, this is a question about something else. Is there a question? Uh, is there a time for public comments on, uh, on we, other that, issues? That was in the beginning of the meeting. Um, and so we're talking about um, a public art project right now. Okay, well, there's a nice razor wire art project up on Montesano Road that you guys might want to look at. It's a okay. death trap. And uh, uh, Brian, we're, we're talking about the public art right now. So we're going to- Oh, it's public. On um no that, that's it's okay um so we're gonna move on to mike nichols mike thank you very much chair i really want to commend uh, Kristen for the uh bilingual slide deck i believe this is the first and hopefully the forerunner of future presentations made to our uh lower rush river mac it's vital that we uh are able to communicate to all members of the community and hats off Kirsten, because I think, I think you're the first that's done it. And I just hope that future presentations follow. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Um, any other hands up? <clears throat> Jason, you see anyone? I do not, Chair. All right. Thank you so much. That was really informative, and um, I, I I hope for the best on this because it really uh, actually is an important thing going on. So thank you. I uh, challenge my felt my following presenters to make you smile and be happy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we're going to talk about trash. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks all. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, Lisa. Okay, I'll try to be happy. And um, so basically we're gonna have two speakers tonight. We are gonna have Carol uh, Shumate from Russian River Keepers and we're gonna have Lucy Hardcastle from Forestville Planning Association. Each person will speak for 
three to four minutes and we'll keep it on the time frame. Um, our trash group is reinvigorated. Thanks very much to Elise, Alice and, um, and Debbie and Vicki, who's a volunteer and um, Carol's guidance. So Carol is the clean team director for Russian Riverkeeper. She probably needs no introduction, but I'm introducing her anyway. And um, she started, this is also in the report on page nine of 10 in our packet. Carol started with the River Keepers in 2015, and she is now a director. She's going to speak to the group. She's a part of our trash ad hoc. Off you go, Carol, with your, yep, unmuted. There you go. Awesome. First of all, I'll thank you everybody for letting me be a part of this. Hello, all my peeps out there, everybody. Um, yeah, so most of you know me. I'm actually the director of the clean team uh, part of Russian Keeper as of a little over a year ago. Um, our new developments are we've, we've been able to hire a couple part-time people uh, to help out um with the programs that we have existing which the first of, first and foremost is the clean camp program which i say is quite successful in 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 large because it's providing a trash service for the homeless and we've been doing that um for uh, a good five years um all the way from cloverdale down the monterio duncan's mills area uh we haul probably uh, summer's a little low, uh, but probably about uh, 10,000 to 12,000 pounds of trash every month. In the winter, it's higher because things are wet, maybe. But this is trash that's staged by the homeless. They clean their own camps. We give them bags. They clean them. They stage them in various areas. We pick them up every week and give them empties and see you next week. Uh, we're kind of their trash service. Like we all have a trash service. They now have a trash service. So we've been providing that program for quite a while. Uh, and I believe it's quite successful. Um, anyway, so other areas that, um, and these are sort of, sort of goals um, that I want to accomplish here as the director of the clean team is to uh remediate some of the problems i see about uh roadside dumping which has now become more uh extensive um in lieu of some of the um uh policies that we that our trash service is now instilled for instance as of october 1st august 1st sorry august 1st uh our trash service is now no longer taking mattresses in most locations, they only take them in two, and they're now $49 per mattress to get rid of. So guess what people are doing? They're dumping them on the roadway. Uh, so this is a problem. And, and, and there's other areas that our uh, trash ad hoc committee is isolating about things that are difficult for people to get rid of. For instance, in Sonoma County, you wanna get rid of a can of paint? You gotta go all the way to Petaluma to the central station to get rid of a can of paint. What if you live like in Sea Ranch? That's kind of hard to do. So these are things we need to address. Uh, I'd like to see changes um, to make it easier to get rid of things. Uh, and uh, like I said, trash, that's hard to get rid of. So um, another part that I want to see expand is this wonderful program called the Adopt a Roadway. Uh, which replicates the adopt a highway that Caltrans has had for many, many years. And I just really want to try to get that going. Um, I'd love it if we can get some free advertising, maybe in the Press Democrat about it. I, I talked to a lot of friends in the last week, and they don't even have a clue. They don't even know what it's about. So I'd like to uh, promote that. I think that's going to resolve a lot of the um uh, ability for volunteers to, um, you know, clean our highways, clean their, clean their neighborhood, clean the streets in their neighborhood. So, um, and 
Carol, sorry to uh, yeah. jump in just really quickly that um, yeah. anyone needs info on Adopt a Road, I can send you all the forms and I'll put my email address in the chat. Carol, you've been, I, I you've been su such a wealth of knowledge for our group. I'm sure everyone in the yeah. group will agree, like Alice, Lucy, I see you shaking your head. Um, it's just yeah. been it check thank you so on. much for that i want yeah, yeah i know you've got so much info and um did you want yeah. to say any other pieces of info right now and then we'll cruise over to lucy for her little bit and then get questions at the end one more real quick as i want to promote a volunteer trash program and um that's going to take some uh, planning some volunteering uh, and some funding. So, I mean, we're kind of kind of low on the funding end of that. Um, we, um, be, because we were able to hire a few more people to help me out with the clean team, um, uh, hopefully I'll be able to, to get some of those rolling, uh, hopefully soon. Yeah. So volunteering, yes. Go on RussianRiverKeeper.org to sign up to volunteer. Yes. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Thank you so much, Carol. And you mentioned hazardous waste. I wanted to let everyone know before I yeah. introduce Lucy that um, you can go on the Zero Waste Sonoma website, which I can also put in the chat. Courtney Scott, who I met with, runs that program. And there are actually places, there are dump days uh, for hazardous waste all around the county. And you can sign up like in Forestville, we did a little bit of publicity to beta test it. And Whereas last year there were 12 people that went to the hazmat dumping day at the fire station. This year we got 49. So, and there's 80 slots. So every little paint can can go there. So that helps. So uh, just before I introduce Lucy, I want to say that um, she's going to talk about the community cleanup that we just had in Forestville. Um, in order to get ready for this, we had county support and zero waste Sonoma a waste zero Sonoma support. So um, we we spoke to Ambrosia Thompson at Recology, Malin Chow and Maureen Niemeyer, the public education manager. Um, we spoke with Glenn Morelli and Brandon Hart at the county who are engineers who helped pull this together. And then at the end, we had friends of Rio Nido, uh, Marcy Hennen and Ingrid Emming who came on for like the last bit of support and we so appreciated that. So without further ado, Lucy, I'm gonna to throw to you for three minutes or so. And um, I don't know if you wanna start with the TikTok or end with the TikTok, it's up to you. Lisa. Lucy, I'm, I'm, oh, Lucy Hardcastle, sorry, is the president of Forestville Planning Association. She's also the Forestville alternate for this Mac. So thanks, Lucy. You're welcome, Lisa. We do have a TikTok and we've got a, what is a really fun to look at uh, time lapse about how that day went. However, I do not believe because I don't, didn't, wasn't able to send it in a format that they could use it. So I'm afraid um, what I'm going to tell you and anyone who's listening, go to 95436.org, 95436.org. And there you'll see the videos and a lot of explanation in terms of what happened that day. And what I want to say, in addition to Lisa talking about giving um, acknowledgement to the people who helped make this happen, let me just say in the end, it was just an idea. Can we have a cleanup day for Forestville? Went to a trash committee meeting, met Carol, all of a sudden, what was just like, I don't know, how do you do this? And her energy and her know-how really pushed this forward. So we got it done in record time, created this event. Let's just say I had 10 volunteers, eight cars in line at any given time, uh, seven 20 yard dumpsters completely full to the brim uh, in only four hours. And it blew our minds in terms of how many people uh, needed, wanted this uh, community resource. And it made the FPA really proud that we could pull it off, but we know we couldn't have pulled it off without all the people that Lisa mentioned and Lisa doing all the paperwork and another uh, board member, Kelly, doing a lot of the paperwork. I put up signs everywhere around town. It really took like the village as they say, but if you wanna see more about it, just check out the website from the FPA. 
Right. And I will also say, Lucy, Kelly uh, from the FPA was a force and I forgot to mention her. And that was amazing. And to everyone out there, I put my email address in the chat and I will do all the paperwork for you and with you. Um, and I can help you with all that stuff. Uh, we yeah. just need a sponsoring 501c3 is all you need, of which that was the FPA. So let's show the TikTok. Okay, give me one second. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not doing it. There we go. I'm here to help the community. We all are. It's um, an opportunity to keep all the trash out of the rivers. And it's our first annual, and we'll see how it goes. I'm a new um, resident of Forestville, and I wanted to get involved. And my boyfriend and I bought a house where the previous owners didn't pay for trash removal. Okay. And there was a lot of trash, and so I know how overwhelming it is and how great it is to get rid of stuff. So I'm here to help facilitate that. nothing but lines since even before we opened. So something to learn, it's going to be more popular than you realize. You're going to need way more dumpsters than you realize. But we are grateful for all the volunteers who have helped us pull this off, try to explain to people why they're waiting so long, and uh, just grateful that this is something we can do for our community. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, I am so happy right now. I can't, I don't even know what else to say. That was amazing. And again, so it's free. Recology donates everything. Brandon at the county submits the paperwork. I'll fill out the paperwork. So all you need is a 501c3 and enthusiasm. Someone like Lucy, Alice, Vicky, Carol, et cetera, everyone, Kelly. And our next trash meeting is October 20, I can't remember, I think it's the seventh, but uh, is it Alice the 27th? Okay, October 27th, email me if you'd like to get involved and go to 95436.org to see more info. Awesome, thank you. I think that's it for me, Pip. All Mic right, drop. Thank, thank you all. Um, any questions or comments from folks on the council? Uh, Alice. I, I just really want to thank uh, Carol and all of the river keepers uh, from this being an idea in Forestville and Lucy was amazing, but she presented it and Carol took it and ran with it as far as like, this is how many volunteers you're going to need. This is your timeline. This is how to deal with recology. There were snafus that day um, and they were handled. Uh, there was an amazing community show up. I think that this could be used as a wonderful template for all of our communities in the river to stage these kinds of events because seven dumpsters, that's trash that's not in the river. That's not just, you know, trashing our community. So it was beautiful. It was one of the most optimistic things I've seen in a long time. So thank you everybody, Lucy, Carol, all of y'all, <laughs> beautiful stuff. All right, thank, thank, thanks, Alice. Uh, Vesta? Um, there was once a, a program where people were encouraged to take bags and just pick up trash on a random basis when they take walks. Uh, I would love to see that encouraged again, and perhaps there is some funding that could have some bags that are recyclable ba little bags, uh, gloves to protect your hands, trash pickers, reflective vests, cones to put out if you're going to do a section of the road, uh, wherever you are, something that uh, encourages people to do it on a random basis as opposed to just an organized basis. All right, uh, Carol? Lucy, you rock. 
I know that um, I'm, I was glad to be a part of organizing that. I would love to see this as a model for doing it on other parts of the river like Guerneville and Monterio that need it just as badly as Forestville. Um, so I'd like to, you know, you know, maybe we can organize and get a template going where we can present this right. in an easy form for other organ or other other uh, communities to do the same thing. Because it and it was epic. This was amazing. I had a great fun um, helping out with it, and uh, it was much needed, obviously. Right, Thanks. Carol, you you're also so epic, and Lucy is even more also epic because she's already written it up, and we do want to publish oh. a document where yeah. all the steps are are there, so people have a template to move forward. Because Chair Pip kind of tasked us with this couple months back and now it's done and Lucy's actually written it but we wanted to kind of you know tweak it to make it look just a little more um present uh it's uh, the content is there we'll, we'll have it for the next meeting and it, and it, it looks happy right so happy <laughs> so right. happy well, great great job everyone <laughs> I can't I can't recommend these kinds of days enough to folks we we did them on an annual basis for a, a while in Rio Nido, and then we're doing it every few years now and it just makes an enormous difference in your community so any other mac rep out there go go do it in your community all right any uh other comments from council uh public comment Anyone want to talk about trash or how to organize a day like this? I don't see anyone on Zoom. Anyone on Facebook, Jason? No, don't, don't have anybody who wants to talk trash. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you all. Okay, we're gonna move on to uh, uh, Gary and he's gonna talk about the t next two items on the agenda. Um, one about the implementation of the uh, vacation ordinance which i'm really happy that we're talking about here because there's a lot of people that are that need clarification about what's going on because i hear different things from different people um and then he's going to talk about an input uh planning process for the community for the r1 um resort area inclusion zone so gary i thank see you it. i'm going to share my screen and once again, could you verify that that's legible because I have to show a portion of my screen? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, so then the whole slide is showing up. Yes, it is. Excellent, thank you. Um, so the vacation rental uh, program update is bifurcated what used to just be a zoning entitlement. Uh, we're now requiring that you still get um, a zoning permit that authorizes the property to have a vacation rental and then the license is going to authorize the actual operation and the important distinction here is you you can have multiple properties um permitted to have a vacation rental but you can only have one license at a time and i'll get into how that works a little bit further down when we get into how the licensing program goes but the board uh, did adopt amendments to chapter 26. So Gary, the Gary, I'm sorry, but someone, um, two people have pointed out to me that they can actually see part of your notes field. And I doubt there's anything in there that's well, yeah, okay. But somebody said, to be aware of it. There you go. Now it's okay, we could do the whole slide before, and we could also see just okay. The, we did it with sorry, slide. yeah, we did we did a test run before, and it needed to have that extended area in the bottom. Um, okay, so it's still clear, not pixelated. It looks good to me. Sorry for Excellent. the interruption. No, that's 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 very good. Good input. Um, <clears throat> one of the big changes that that I, I want to discuss with the Mac tonight is the um, the board um, adopted a change to the zoning code that prohibits vacation rentals in R one, which is low density residential, and this is most of the central area of Guerneville, Guernwood Park, Rio Nido, um, Neely Road, and parts of Drake Road. So that's, it It covers more areas throughout the county, but within the lower Russian River, those are the primary areas 
that are affected um, by this prohibition. And we're also requiring um, more restrictive parking and occupancy standards. That is, there won't be exceptions anymore. There won't be the ability to have more people during the day than you have at night. Whatever your permitted capacity is, is your permitted capacity. The license um, ordinance, which is still in process, the board came back with a number of changes and county council felt that we should do another reading. That board meeting hasn't been scheduled, but I'll go over with, um, with uh, the MAC some of the changes that are being recommended. Um, one thing that was supported though is limiting licenses to natural persons, one license per individual. So this means that um, people and family trusts can have vacation rentals, uh, but corporations will not be eligible to hold a vacation rental, um, excuse me, license. You could still get a zoning permit, but you can't operate because you can't get a license. Um, and the, the focus there is, is really to make this ordinance favor people who've got a second home and they just wanna get some extra income from it as opposed to encouraging institutional investors that are going to you know, buy dozens of homes, which we've seen more in Sonoma Valley than in the river. Um, but that was the, the uh, impetus behind this part of the ordinance. Um, there's also a countywide moratorium on vacation rentals, and that expires May 9th, 2023. The cap ordinance in the lower Russian River has already expired, but that's, that's kind of moot at this point because there's a countywide moratorium. The big new thing, everybody should write down this number, is the 24-7 vacation rental hotline is live, it's, it's working, and it's online. So if people have problems, um, call this number, and it's staffed 24-7. There'll always be a live person that you can talk to, and they will contact the property manager and resolve whatever problem is going on. And if the problem is not resolved, they'll document um, the violation and pass that on to code enforcement for further action. The advantage that we have now with a license as opposed to just a zoning permit is, is we can do proportional enforcement. I mean, it, with our current system, you just, we could revoke your permit and that was it. Um, we can now do civil fines, we can do temporary suspensions. So the idea is, is not all violations are created equal and some aren't even intentional. And uh, we have a lot of tools in the toolbox because of the way the license ordinance is constructed. So the, the R1 zoning was supported, but the more it was looked into, it seemed like it has a unique set of unintended consequences in Guerneville. In many, in many areas, areas that have that zoning really don't have a nexus to the local uh, tourism economy or the local economy really isn't particularly tourism based. Guerneville is very unique in, in that it not only has a tourism based economy, but it, it really needs local lodging to support that. And this was an idea that um, was recommended to the planning commission in 2016, but because um, of various other things going on with the vacation rental ordinance at that time, never made it to the board of supervisors. So um, staff is, is now reviving the idea of resort area combining districts. So this gives an exception to that prohibition only in areas where we need lodging and the lodging is there to support local visitor serving uses and, and support the local economy. Um, it's still under development, so I don't have exact language to, to share with you, um, but that's the concept. And the idea is unlike a cap, it would be an area where we would say there needs to be a specific number of rooms available in this area to support the local tourism economy. And it, you know, it'd be kind of like taxi medallions used to be, where there's X number of licenses that can be held in the Guerneville area. And when one is abandoned, then there'll then they'll be one that comes available, but it won't be as a percentage of the number of houses, which is, which is how the cap works. And just to let everyone see where the R1 zoning is, and, and I apologize for the colors on this map, but 
the gray areas are the areas that are zoned R1. Almost, it's the areas that have the, the horizontal green hatching are not R1. So once again, you got uh, Gurnwood Park, Vacation Beach, um, Central Gurnville, Armstrong Woods, uh, Rio Nido, and the two residential areas and Drake Road are all zoned R1. Basically, any property that's receiving sewer service is, is zoned R1 in, in this area. Um, and there's the rentals are concentrated around the other visitors serving uses. So um, staff is, is going to do some, some real looking into how many, what number of vacation rentals do we need to maintain a, a vibrant tourism economy without interfering with our housing stock without interfering with neighborhood characters. So there'll be a balancing that needs to occur. And uh, I'm, we're putting this out right now to the MAC where we want to come back in December and have some real in-depth discussion about this with specific policy options. But the, the idea here is to get everybody thinking about this or if it's even necessary. I mean, that's the other thing we would want to hear is, um, we've received enough input to think that it is, but we would of course look to the local community uh, for guidance on that. Outside of the R1, um, we will be proposing rezoning some properties to have a vacation rental um, cap. Now this is a couple of important things is applying the cap, the cap is in the legislation. So it's part of the county codes but actually applying that code is a change in zoning. So the process that we have to go through would be the same as for any zone change. All property um, owners are notified. There'll be a uh, public outreach. Then it goes to the planning commission. There'll be a public hearing. Planning commission will make a recommendation and the board of supervisors then would um, adopt or not adopt uh, the planning commission's recommendation. So, so there will be a fairly robust public process behind this. Our staff's plan right now is to use the research that we did for the vacation rental cap to initially define the areas. And I'll share that map with everybody here. Um, in other parts of the county, it, it's gonna be very difficult to identify discrete neighborhoods here, but we, we feel this is a fairly good indication of not the actual total boundary of the neighborhood, but the developed boundary of the neighborhood. For instance, Rio Nido doesn't include those fingers that go way up the canyons that are filled with vacant parcels. It just covers the areas that the assessor use code says are, are developed parcels. Um, and we would really look to all the communities to talk to me, talk to us and help us fine tune these maps, make sure this is really representative of how you see your community boundaries. Uh, we'll also be merging this with um, uh, census block data. That's the smallest geographic unit that's in the census. Um, it includes, you know, like single blocks, single areas bounded by two roads. And that will let us look at other things like demographic data within the area. So we, the, we've heard a lot of input that we need to make data-driven decisions, and that is always where we should start from. I mean, in the end, we may have to fine tune things with subjective um, input, but we really need to know things about income level, about occupancy of the homes, and the census data is going to at least give us a good first stab at, at doing that. The ordinance only allows right now two levels of con three levels of concentration because it allows an exclusion, which is no vacation rentals. Then it allows 5%, and that's the percentage of vacation rentals relative to the number of single family homes in an area. So it does not count condominiums and apartment buildings, does not count accessory dwelling units, it counts single family dwellings, and where you have parcels in actually is eligible single family dwelling. So if you have a parcel say that has two homes on it and one's legal non-conforming, that would still count as, as a single home for the purposes of calculating um, the cap. 
we have, you know, the work that we did on this was done before COVID. Um, obviously, dur during COVID is really not going to give us particularly, I think, accurate data on uh, number of vacation rentals that we have in an area because we've seen a lot of people just, um, you know, abandon their permits or sold. Mostly, they sold their property because they they were were not making any money um, during the pandemic. But this gives it the average concentration in the lower Russian River is was 10.4%. And I just want to emphasize, this is a snapshot in time. This is not necessarily what we're seeing right now. And the other thing to emphasize is none of these regulations are going to be retroactive. So if we apply a cap in, say, the Neely Road neighborhood, um, it, this doesn't mean anybody's going to lose their ability to operate their vacation rental. They can operate it until they sell the property. And then at that point, um, the, the, the zoning permit associated with the property expires and the license is void. Um, and the new owner would then have to apply. So we'd, we'd wait till the number finally dropped down low enough to be below the cap. And we found that number drops very slowly. The neighborhood where we have been able to do some real research is um, Fitch Mountain, <clears throat> and that's we've we've had a, have an exceptionally engaged community group up there. Uh, but that's about 350 homes in in that neighborhood. So it's you know it's a little bit on the it's kind of in the middle of all the neighborhoods in the Lower Russian River. And they had an exclusion zone placed on their community in 2016. And from 2016 till today, which is six years, we have seen um, six homes be sold that had vacation rentals. So very, very slow rate of attrition there. That's also important to consider in the context of the, the R1 zone and its effect on the economy of Guerneville that everybody can keep operating, that the prohibition doesn't mean, absolutely does not mean anybody loses their current entitlement. Um, and if it, if we see things behave the same as we've seen it behave up by Healdsburg, that it will take years for there to be any real significant drop in the number of vacation rentals in that area. So um, we, we feel, staff feels that we've got a little bit more time to work on um, the vacation, the resort area combining district uh, as as compared to getting the caps right and getting the caps in place because we really need to hit that expiration um, deadline on, on the countywide moratorium for the caps to be effective. So the, li the license ordinance, this is the other half of the program. Um, I think most of this, if you've got questions, um, kind of gone over over it. Um, but the big emphasis is it gets renewed annually, and they are limited to individuals and and trusts. Um, but once again, if you have an LLC and you own 15 vacation rentals, nothing is taken away retroactively. Um, if you have a permit that lets you have a high occupancy during the daytime, that's not taken away retroactively. It's not until the property sells and selling is defined as when there is a what's called a documentary transfer tax. So <clears throat> if things happen like there's an interspousal transfer, there's a refinance, there is um, an inheritance, those are not transfers of property. It's, it's when it's when we assess the transfer tax that that's considered to be a sale of the property for the purposes um, of this ordinance. There are a few other things that, that I'd heard from the MAC last time we were here that I did want to touch on is, um, because this was an excellent recommendation we got, is the, the license ordinance is going to require um, every vacation rental to have an operational landline or broadband connected wired VoIP phone and also have a NOAA uh, emergency radio that's functional on the property. Um, all the vacation rentals are going to be subject to fire safe standards and your license is temporarily suspended um, 
you know, if, if the property is inspected by Cal Fire and needs a little bit cl of cleaning up, you've got to clean it up before um, you can rent again. We also added a section in there clarifying that when the owner or their family is in residence that the performance standards do not apply so that there won't be any confusion of, you know, it's best that people aren't rude to each other, but if they happen to be rude, it's not a violation of their license and it doesn't put their permit in jeopardy. Uh, <clears throat> so if uh, that's between you and your neighbor at, the, at that point. Um, we're also allowing property managers to delegate their authority to other certified managers. And we've removed the residency standards. That is a standard that said that um, a manager has to live within a certain distance of the property. And we're, we're replacing it with the performance standard that at night, the problem needs to be resolved in 30 minutes. And during the day, the problem needs to be resolved in one hour, which was in the old ordinance. Um, but staff's recommendation here is how it's solved really isn't as important as that it's solved. And with our hotline, we can now document whether or not the property manager is performing. And they're going to put their, their uh, certification at risk if if they don't perform and they'll put the person's license at risk. But um, we received a lot of input from vacation rental operators that that was kind of an arbitrary standard and why shouldn't the standard just be, can you solve the problem? And so that's the new recommend. And want to emphasize, these are recommendations we're making to the board of supervisors. Um, this hasn't been heard yet in, in a public meeting. And that's that's about it for changes. But I, we're the thing that I'd really like to get input on is the concept of a resort area combining district for Guerneville. If that is something that is necessary, and if it is necessary, how big of an area does it need to cover to be effective? So that's it. I mean, if you've got questions, I'm I'm here to answer questions. I'm sure everybody's going to have lots of them. Thanks. Let me stop sharing my screen. There we go. Okay. Thank, thank you, Gary. All right. Um, let's gonna we're gonna turn it over to council for 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 comments. Uh, Naomi. Hi, Gary. Thank you. Um, I just had one question. So, well, one question and one comment. <laughs> I'll make it brief. As far as the twenty-four hour hotline, which I am going to assume is helpful for those who don't know how to contact management for a vacation rental that they find is problematic. Is that um, telephone line up and operational as far as if I was to call today, was to mention an address, would they currently have the managing partner information there or is that being built as time goes by? That it's, it's built, it's online, and we've run it through a couple of, of beta tests. And it is okay. also wired into our permitting system. So they're also able to see whether or not there's a valid permit on that. Okay, parcel. so we think that it's um, current, I guess, in real time. Uh, yeah, well, the permit then, information has to be because that's, that's. No, going no, no, I understand. Yeah. I just didn't know if they were building the contact information versus the street address or if they had all of that sitting behind there before they opened up the phone number. So I understand. That's all, what yeah, that, that's all sitting there. And, and as long as the information provided by the operator is accurate, they should be able to contact the property okay. manager. Thank you. And then I just had um, one other question slash comment. As far as I understand, an ADU on a property is not applicable to get a short-term vacation rental permit at this point in time. Am I correct on that? That's correct. And that's in the ADU ordinance, not in it. The ADU ordinance is very clear that neither a ADUs or JDUs can be used for transient rentals. Okay. So do you know if that might be something that would be looked at as far as um, transitioning to short-term rentals that in my opinion, might help the property owner maintain their property and keep it, and then also basically be an active, almost hosted vacation rental, if you know, which would, I would assume, have less um, problems than one that doesn't have a manager nearby. 
Well, like I said, that would be a matter of, of amending a whole different part of the zoning code. Okay. Um, not sure how possible that is. It's, yeah, I, I do know that, you know, ADUs are an extra entitlement that the state of California has mandated that we allow property owners to have specifically based on providing long-term housing. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm not sure whether or not we even have the flexibility to do that. Um, okay. Certainly you can send us an email and we'll take a look at it as a mm -hmm. policy option. Okay, Gary, thank you. Uh, Vesta? Um, there are still people who are reporting unlicensed uh, vacation rentals. When an unlicensed vacation rental gets, when someone recalls the hotline, what happens if they're not in your system? It, well, if it's, if it's not in our, if we show no record of a vacation rental permit for a property that immediately gets referred to code enforcement who will do an investigation, um, a fairly quick one, because it's not, it's not tough for us to find out whether or not you have a vacation rental permit for your property. If they don't have a permit, then it goes right into enforcement. And then, a, a, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then the other one around the concept of uh, an area doesn't have enough hotels and motels, so there is no lodging for guests to come into an area and that would impact tourism. That means that um, vacation rentals are a better option for that area. Is that what you're saying about the combining districts and that whole land of what's available if it's a tourism economy? No, that's actually not what, what I'm saying is that we're offering this as a policy option because Guerneville has kind of a unique situation compared to any other areas with a tourism based economy um, where where vacation rentals are not really necessary to accommodate the number of people that it takes to support the local economy. This may be something that isn't necessary. It may be necessary. It may involve a very small area in the core of Guerneville. It, it might be bigger. Um, we're right now in the stage of just developing the ordinance. Well, developing a policy option for the board to consider. So it's at that. It's a, it's a much earlier stage, I think, than maybe you think it is. Okay, so that's like mostly Guerneville, but like other communities that have no motels and no hotels. How does that impact the percentage of vacation rentals, or does it impact it at all? Well, no, they, because they don't necessarily have a commercial business district that relies on tourism. Well, the restaurants and shops would, not necessarily just lodging. So how do you judge whether it's dependent upon tourism in order to be economically viable? That's something where, you know, this is one of those things. How do you do design review? How do you decide what an ugly <laughs> okay. building is or what an attractive building is? Uh, I mean, and this is this is why I made my earlier comment about about uh, data driven decisions having to be then, I guess, fine tuned with our hearts is the best way to think of it. Mm -hmm. um, a community knows what it is. And, you know, I would say. I, I can only speak for where I live, like Occidental, it wouldn't have any effect that, that they attract people from a very wide area and most of them don't need to spend the night to use the restaurant. Okay. Um, but it's context sensitive. Um, and, and of course, Cas you know, Casadero, do they need people to support the hardware store? Um, is, is very different than that really vibrant commercial strip that's in Guerneville. I mean, Guerneville is, is really kind of unique compared to other areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, Cynthia, <clears throat> you're mute. You're mute. All right. Hi, Gary. Hi. Listen, I, um, I'm, I'm just a tad confused. Okay, going back to the map that you showed with various neighborhoods, uh, some in blue, some, some in red, okay, um, and with being 5% and 10% uh, were vacation rentals, does that mean that any neighborhood that was not 
uh, drawn out in either the blue or the red is a uh, R1 neighborhood and uh, no more uh, vacation rentals would be allowed. Okay, um, yeah, that maybe I was not clear on, on what was being discussed there. A lot of those areas um, are not R1 zone, like Summer Home Park, um, mm -hmm. but okay. they do have a high concentration. So the, the way, that, so the first thing is stepping back and looking is pretty much if you have a septic system, you're not R1. That's the easiest way to think of it. If you're on a septic, okay. you're rural residential, so it doesn't have any effect. Um, but okay. this, you know, the kind of strip from Northwood up to Rio Nido is all served by the Neely Road uh, wastewater treatment plant. So those areas within the sanitation district are within R1, but it doesn't mean that there aren't other areas that have high concentration. And, and so we need to look at at all the areas. So there's two independent things here. One is some of those areas, if the resort area combining district is something that isn't supported by the community or by the board, you know, if it doesn't happen, um, the R1 prohibition sort of solves the problem itself. And there's no need to, you know, put a cap on something. It's like killing something twice. I mean, you don't you don't need sure. to do it. That that natural attrition will slowly over time reduce the number of vacation rentals. And and also to be clear, like I said, we're not making anything retroactive. So none of this. It isn't as if you could say there's too many vacation rentals in my neighborhood. Apply a cap and fix the problem. Yeah. It might fix the problem in five or six years. I mean, we we see enforcement is the thing that fixes the problem right away you know getting rid of the bad actors getting rid of people who just are not responsibly operating their vacation rentals that's take care that takes care of the nuisance issue doesn't take care of the housing issue doesn't take care of the neighborhood compatibility issue but it does take care of one of the issues that's that's generated and so that's that's the easiest okay. one for us to deal with is is the the noise, the garbage, the parking, things like that. But your community character is, that's tough. And like I said, that's something yeah. that data doesn't tell you. Yeah. But so you're saying that if you are on a septic, you're in a uh, rural residential, but then you, you might possibly be able to get a vacation rental license. Oh yeah. And uh, not, okay. uh, you, you, you can right, right now. Okay. And, you, you know, there might like, like Villa Grand might decide that they want to do a five, and, and it's going to be community by community, decide that they okay. want to do a 10%, which would actually let it grow a little bit, then there'd be a handful of new permits that could be issued. And, and, you know, I haven't done any research on Villa Grand, so don't take this the wrong way. Okay. But, okay. you know, they could say, this seems right for our community, we just don't want it to go past this point. And, Great. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what we do. And it balances community character with people's ability to, you know, make some money off their second home. I think we're also going to see um, a downtick in the number of vacation rentals with permit restriction with license restrictions going forward on LLCs and corporations owning multiple vacation ah, rentals. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Once again, we're not taking that away. They can still do it. But as they sell those properties, they they're going back into the regular system. All right, um, we're gonna we're gonna um, go to public. Uh, there's a few people that have their hands up, and we really only have 15 minutes okay. left. Okay, sorry. That, that's okay. Um, uh, so, uh, David. Uh, hi everyone. I wanted to introduce myself. My name is David Wavell. I'm the owner and operator of the Old Casadero Cabin since 2014. I'm also the treasurer of the Ch Russian River Chamber of Commerce. My opinions tonight represent my own and do not represent the chamber. Um, I also want to just let everybody know that uh, if they don't know, if they do not know an operator of a vacation rental property they should get to know us. And that's gonna be a really good way for you to form an informed opinion about 
the uh, the hard work that we all put into our property. I'm licensed and I encourage licensing. I'm equally uh, not happy with folks that don't have a permit. So I'm liking the fact that we are now putting more rigor around that. Um, I'm happy to hear Gary say that uh, Guerneville needs local lodging and the resort area combining district I would endorse. Um, I'm also in favor of community character. Guerneville has been a, a long time vacation rental or vacation destination. Um, I do think that the LLC restrictions make sense. Um, I'm an individual owner and I think that's really a good thing. Um, I do think that transference is missing from the ordinance. Every other business in the United States that you put energy and heart and soul into, you hope you can sell someday. And by not having transference in the, in the, in the ordinance, I feel is very unfair. Um, I don't think performance standards are a big deal. I think the vast majority of us that, that work uh, to host people in a proper way have very high performance standards for ourselves. So I think um, those are very fair. I don't really have a POV on the BIA increase. I would encourage the SCT to hold themselves accountable to the additional taxes that we are paying and make sure that the incremental amount that we're paying pays off in terms of additional bookings and doesn't harm our ability to, uh, to, to uh, do business. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we're gonna move to Alex, Alex C. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, great. Oh, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for letting me speak. Um, me and my boyfriend have a little cabin in Rio Nido. We are, you know, I guess what you'd call these days dual residents. We'd, we're there and then then we travel when we go to the office. So we love Sonoma County. We've been visiting Guerneville for 15 plus years. And I think that it's super important to, when we talk about neighborhood character, to remember that the area historically has been a, you know, a vacation rent, a, a vacation place. And I, I, for me, it's like, it's this unique mix of full-time folks, second, second uh, homeowners. Like we have a lot of second homeowners around us. There are some of them from the city. Some of them are not. Some of them just decided to, you know, they were second homeowners and then like, we're going to live there now because, you know, we're getting older. Some of, you know, there's probably one vacation rental, you know, down the street. My point being is this is the fabric of Guerneville and I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want it to to be lost. And I think that, you know, Gary, we looked at your maps. Those maps are all R1. So, you know, we're looking at Guerneville uh, being a tourist, you know, what its core is a tourist and a visitor kind of destination for people from San Francisco and the Bay Area. And now you're, and everybody wants to be, you know, around the center of it, but all the center is R1. So yeah, we absolutely need, you know, my friends, when they come visit, they don't have where to stay. So we absolutely need R1 to have a cap, so not to be prohibited to have a cap. And we absolutely have to keep this place, you know, what it is, a mix of full-time residents, second homeowners and uh, visitors. And I just wanna say, just because we're not there 100% of the time, doesn't mean we're not part of the community. We are, and we know our neighbors and they're awesome and we love them, whether they're second homeowners or full-time renters. I mean, full-time resident, sorry. Okay, next we have Mike Nichols. Mike? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, you know, in the state of Hawaii, they, they've been dealing with uh, vacation rentals for, for years and years and years. And they've simplified this uh, whole process so that they, uh, when, when a vacation rental is advertised, a copy of the license has to be on the actual advertisement. Also, a copy of the license is posted on the door in Hawaii. So the, the renter knows that they're living or staying in a legitimate rental. And if there's a property manager involved, the property manager's contact information is also included in this document that's posted on the door. My concern is that in many of the areas along the lower Russian River, we 
and, and looking at Gary's presentation on the number of vacation rentals, I would venture to say that there are probably very, very many more vacation rentals than are what were, were represented on the uh, chart. Uh, and as Gary aptly said, you know, this chart was developed in uh, 2020. And since COVID, there have been a number of changes. So uh, I think we need to take a good hard look at uh, <clears throat> somehow managing to craft some sort of legislation to allow the uh, license number to be appearing on an advertisement so that uh, we can keep, so that the county can keep track of what's going on. I think that concludes my comments. Thank you. Okay, if I could just chime in quickly, I, I neglected to cover that part of the license ordinance. Uh, it does require not only the license number, but the permitted occupancy, number of vehicles allowed, um, and quiet hours to be part of all advertising, and requires a copy of the license to be posted at the rental within six feet of the front door. Hey, Eric? Yes, thank you very much. This is Eric Frazier with Truth and Tourism. I appreciate having the opportunity to address you again. Gary, thanks for your hard work. Uh, overall though, it seems to me that this whole approach to STR regulations, vacation rental regulations, is just really to create job security for Permit Sonoma because they never get it right. And in fact, the problem is it's never based on facts. And here we again hear it today with the vocabulary being an X number of vacation rentals, but that refers to permits, not those that are operating. It's like everything is exaggerated to the fact to make it look bad without even knowing the underlying market dynamics. This claim of corporate ownership in the Sonoma Valley, that, that area has been an exclusion zone for quite some time now, several years, in fact, long enough, so that economists can actually study the effect of some of these tropes, which are turning out to be factless, meaningless, and just meant to excite negative STR uh, sentiments. When we talk about pro proportionality of enforcement, that's great. But when are you going to get a handle on proportionality of use? Just as an earlier sp speaker commented, they just use, they just allow the access space to be utilized occasionally. But you guys approach it as if everybody is just a full out vacation rental, 360 days a year, 365 days a year. Ridiculous. Everybody's making a million dollars. All these tropes, all these tropes. Why don't you get to the real deal? Uh, and so much more. So that's the thing is that this is just going to go on and on and on where the regulations are absolutely killing you. Research shows where areas that do not have onerous regulations invite in a lot of revenue for development and rehabilitation of existing housing. This is all a very good thing and should never be ignored. That is the driving factor. It's not greed. It's not anything else that you care to call it. Thank you very much. Hi, Megan? my name. Hi, my name is Megan Perkins. I work at Russian River Vacation Homes. I'm also a board member at Russian River Rec and Park District. Um, I'm not speaking for them, however, and uh, a very active member of our community. But I have a couple of quick questions. One is, um, how, you say that you're looking for people to be involved in the community in these definitions of what is our community character and how many vacation rentals there should be. And I've been asking this question repeatedly at different places. How do people get involved? How are you going to select the people to help inform that decision? And um, a little bit of what Eric said about making sure that we've got the data to back it up. So not everything is, um, just the story of my neighbor who told me this story about their neighbor and things like that, because I've heard a lot more anecdotal evidence than I have seen data in the last couple of years when we've talked about vacation rentals. So that's one of my questions. The next is when people are calling the hotline and making complaints, I would like to know how those are being verified. Um, 
I know it is easy to find an address and know if a house has a permit or not, but when we have a neighbor, and this is from my personal experience, who are, um, I hate to say it, but sometimes racist or just unhappy about certain people who are staying in the house, not that they're actually breaking the rules, but we get complaints about things like that because of people's skin color or the fact that they even have children who dare to make noise outside and enjoy a sunny day. And as a property management company, those are really sad complaints to hear about. And I just wanna make sure that those are verified because we love this community and I think everybody should be able to love this community. That's it. Just, just a, a quick follow-up on that is, is of course, you know, unpermitted vacation rentals are a separate thing here where those just go right to code enforcement. This is the first time we've ever been able to collect data on complaints and it cuts both ways. If this is clearly a neighbor that doesn't get along with the operator, that gets investigated and also that gets documented and, and logged and it's gonna be very helpful. Right now, there's, there's nothing that documents that. And since everything gets logged in and all of our follow-up also goes into that database, we'll have a way to identify the situations where there's a pattern of frivolous complaints, just like we can identify those rare situations, relatively rare situations, where the either the operator or the property manager just doesn't care. Um, so it works both ways, but we have to have that documentation and the hotline's gonna give it. To, hotline's gonna do a much better job of giving it to us than our current situation where you don't have a 24 hour a day contact number. Uh, Gary, along those lines, can, can you like um, briefly talk about, because she was talking about engagement, it, what process is in place for community engagement from folks that, that, that want to be engaged? Well, an awful lot of that is, is through the MACs. I mean, the, the, the MAC is kind of our first point of contact. We we have, you know, a challenge that I have is we have one person assigned to both vacation rentals and the local coastal plan. That's it. That's me. I don't have any support staff on that. That's just it's the way it is. I'm not complaining, but I'm just saying that we have limited capacity. We just don't have a lot of staffing. Um, and this ordinance is countywide. So it, it, if it were just the Russian River, I could, I think, I think we could develop some a fairly robust engagement program. But to be fair, uh, we have to deliver. We would then deliver that same program, and we should, in Sonoma Valley and in Dry Creek and in Healdsburg and in all the other parts of the county that have a lot of vacation rentals. And it's it's difficult. So I mean, we really. I think are going to end up leaning on the Mac pretty heavily to help us be the venue. Um, I would hope that er, that all the Mac members have have kind of a different view of the Lower Russian River, have different connections, have different personal networks, and between all of you, you could help us identify. I mean, that's what we need. We need help from you identifying what groups should we meet with, what are the venues that that we that we should use because we have to be efficient about doing this just because of our limited staff capacity. So give us a hand, tell us how to do it. Right, and we appreciate, you have, you've been our um, most frequent guest over the last year, so <laughs> thank you. Ben. Thank you. For that. I, I hope you've gotten something out of people giving you input. So. Well, I have, I, and you know, I just live right up the hill. You should come to one of our meetings sometime. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay, um, I don't see any other. Hold hands. on, Pip. Hold on, hold on. Um, as as okay, someone hey, who's Nick, been Nick, yeah. Nick, hold on. We we were we went from council to public. We got to move on to the next subject now. Sorry. Um. So Elise, um, because we are we're at seven thirty right now, and we did have a chance for for council comment. Elise, can you uh, talk about uh? the election process and on and where we are right now. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Hi. 
Um, well, it's exciting to see that, uh, you know, last couple me meetings, people asked if the postcard had any effect. And I, I think it did because we have uh, competitive races in both Monterio and um, Guernville for the open seats. So we are in the process of uh, putting together a get to know your candidates. We're looking at either the evening of the 27th or Sunday afternoon, the third, and we will send out confirmation of those so that people can get to know the various candidates. And then uh, voting will be open from the 27th until the second. We will have both um, ballot boxes and I'll be sitting by the ballot box in uh, Guerneville and uh, in Monterio. And we will also have the capacity for you to scan and send your and send your ballot in um, electronically. So all that will go out in a, a uh, newsletter and on Facebook. And um, as soon as we've confirmed all of the dates for the candidates to attend the attend the talk. So that's where we are on the on the elections. Yeah, and, and someone just confirmed from Pocket Canyon that they're in. So that's great. Yay, that's great. Um, and then did you, I'm sorry if I missed it. You, you talked, we're gonna do a forum. Yes, we're working on a forum, either Sunday the 30th at three or in the evening of the 27th. And we're working to see uh, if we can get the most candidates at which one of those. Great. Um, anyone have any questions on um, the selection process and candidates and where we, where we are right now? This is a big challenge, you guys. We need people to want to, or we need people to sign up for this because it, it's it is important and it does affect each one of our communities so if you know people reach out and say get involved in some way shape or form okay uh nick is your hand up uh you have a question for elise no uh naomi Thanks, Pip and Elise. I just wanted to see, I'm sorry if I wasn't paying the best of attention, but what areas do we have um, potential turnover, if you will, in um, new folks wanting to run? What, you know, what rep areas? Sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. You're, sorry, asking, Elise. you're asking where, uh, where the open seats are? Yes. Uh, let me pull that up. It's on our website, and so I can read them out loud. Thank uh, you. I know one is mine, so I'm saying yes. thank you, but Gern, not here. Gern, Gern, <laughs> we need an alternate in Rio Nito, um, Pocket Canyon. What did I miss? Okay, Pocket Canyon, we need the representative and an alternate. Casadero, we need a representative and an alternate um, in Guerneville. Oh, Debbie, it looks like you took them down from our website. In Guerneville, we have one uh, representative uh, up and, and uh, because sadly, Naomi is leaving us after many great, two great years representing Guerneville. Um, we also have a, a representative and alternate required for Monterio um, because Kyra Wink has um, left town, has sold her house and left town. Um, we have an alternate in Rio Nido. Um, I was going to use the the uh, the website as a cheat sheet, but I don't have it. Uh, it's not on there anymore. Debbie, did I get it all? I think those are uh, those are the ones that we have open. So we do. Yeah, um, I think you got have, it all. It looks like we have um, uh, candidates for. Pocket Canyon. Um, we have, oh, we also have a uh, turnover in Hacienda. Um, we have uh, Alice is going to move to the alternate position, and uh, we have um, a candidate for who will be joining us in Hacienda as well. All right, great. Um, any other um, questions or comments from uh, the council members? Then uh, if there's any, oh, we do have a hand up, Alice. 
Sorry, I know, I know we're after 7.30. I just wanted to say that in the two years that I've been with this and the election selection processes, we've seen so much community work get done and listened and just been really connected to our communities. So thank you all for your volunteer. I'm, I'm sad to be leaving, but I'm really glad that we'll have new representatives taking over with renewed vigor. This is, the last two years have been such a turnover in the quality of these meetings and thank you all thanks so much right. Alice. um any public comments or questions hands raised chair did you say jason i'm having a real hard time here no you. no hands are raised all right thank you and with that Does someone want to I move to adjourn? There we go. <laughs> Does someone second that? I second. I second that. Okay, we got a lot of seconds. Okay, let's say <laughs> it, let's say it was Naomi. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you.